Okay, super. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to, of course, begin by thanking Gediminas and his collaborators for organizing this really fantastic conference. I've had a really tremendous few days. So the title of my talk yet yeah, is Quantum Hall of Physics in the Quantum Foucault Pendulum. Okay, And so this concerns an ongoing program at MIT where we're looking at rapidly rotating quantum gases and then using high-resolution microscopy to try and learn something about the physics of massive particles in a rotating frame of reference, and then by analogy, the physics of charged particles in a magnetic field. Okay, and so to brush really a lot of experimental details under the rug, this is the setup. Okay, so we have a bosonic gas, in many cases here, um, a BEC of sodium, held inside a trap whose shape and rotation rate can be freely controlled, um, and then imaged using a high-resolution microscope objective. And so during the next 20, 25 minutes or so, um, I'll touch briefly on three topics that have come out of this in the last few years. The first concerns what we term geometric squeezing, and this is quantum mechanical squeezing, um, so a redistribution of Heisenberg uncertainty, but rather than being between, say, position and momentum or different spin projections of a spin system, instead it's between the spatial coordinates of the atoms. Okay, so in a rotating frame of reference, or for charged particles in a B field, um, X and Y themselves, in some sense, become non-commuting. Um, and then the second project, which I'll touch on, was really one of these nice examples of being led by the experiment. It was by seeing something on your screen that you didn't understand, and then the understanding coming later. Um, but it concerns um, a dynamical instability we found. And to, to put this in you know, one or two sentences, it turns out that the Landau gauge wave functions, this is an image of about half a million atoms occupying a single wave function within the Landau gauge, is unstable against any non-zero interaction strength. It exhibits this spontaneous snaking instability, eventually leading to a crystallization. And then third, um, I'll discuss actually what's a very recent project. We have an archive paper out just a month or two ago concerning the injection and then study of the propagation of chiral edge states at the boundary of the system. Okay, so this is an image here um, of directional propagation of atoms at the boundary of a system subject to an artificial gauge field. Okay. And so, the, the, of course, the, you know, this is a fantastic place to be saying this, but the, you know, the history of trying to introduce artificial gauge fields into quantum gases is a long and glorious one. Um, and really, whichever your favored recipe for doing this, what you're trying to do is to cook up some analog of the Aronoff bone phase. Okay? And this is, of course, a geometric phase that a charged particle acquires when it performs a closed loop um, inside a magnetic field. And so there are various fantastic recipes for doing this. The one that we use is um, a very old one, at least within, you know, within the field of cold gases, and it's to work in the rotating frame. And you can see at various levels this is going to do the trick, thinking very qualitatively both rotation and a B-field break time reversal symmetry. Um, more classically, of course, the Coriolis and the Lorentz force both take the form of velocity crossed with something. Um, and more quantum mechanically, the analog of the aronoff bohm phase is provided by the so-called Saniac phase, which is the phase that a massive particle picks up when it performs a closed loop inside a rotating reference frame. And so in the title of the talk, I promised a Foucault pendulum. Um, and so here it is. We're throwing our minds back about a little over 170 years to the Pantheon in Paris, um, where Foucault hung his whopping great pendulum from the ceiling. And really, a Foucault pendulum is nothing more than a 2D harmonic oscillator viewed in a rotating reference frame. And we know that rotation couples to angular momentum, which means that the normal modes of the system are simply co-rotating and counter-rotating circular motion of the pendulum bob. In an inertial frame, these would be degenerate. In a rotating frame, the frequencies are split by the frame rotation rate. And so if you want to figure out the motion of your pendulum, you just have to add together these two motions. And if you do that, you'll obtain epicycles, which in the limit of relatively slow rotation of the frame compared to the pendulum frequency, makes it appear as if the pendulum swings back and forth along an axis, which slowly processes, revealing the rotation of the reference frame that you're in. This is a good moment to introduce some coordinates. These fast counter-rotating um, motion is known as cyclotron orbits with coordinates psi and eta. And these cyclotron orbits occur around the guiding center, which will give coordinates capital X and capital Y. So let's imagine now that we have some magical handle in our lab and we can turn up the rotation rate of the Earth, so it's now spinning at a much more respectable 0.8 times the natural frequency of the pendulum. So now we can still construct epicycles by adding together our two normal modes. Now things start to look a lot more strange. In this case, this pendulum bob skips around some kind of boundary in the system. And if we go even further, so the Earth is now spinning at the natural frequency of the pendulum, the bob still has no problem performing these fast cyclotron orbits, but the position of this orbit within 2D space has become degenerate. Okay, so without doing any calculation, 
we know that the spectrum must separate into discrete lambda levels, each with some colossal degeneracy corresponding to our choice of where we place our guiding center within 2D space and with the spacing set by the energy levels of the cyclotron harmonic oscillator. Okay. And so as everyone knows and learns as an undergraduate, you know that the operators corresponding to the conjugate phase space variables of a harmonic oscillator form a non-commuting pair. And so we therefore infer that the cyclotron coordinates xi and eta form a non-commuting pair and the guiding center coordinates x and y form a non-commuting pair. And a consequence of that is that the generator of x translations is now y and the generator of y translations is x. Okay? And so very differently to an inertial frame, if you take a particle and move it in a closed loop, okay, that animation was supposed to show this, this little blob moving in a square, and ask how its quantum state evolves, you have to stack together four different translation operators. In an inertial frame, these would all commute. In a rotating frame, they do not. And you come back having picked up a phase proportional to the area of the loop. So in the context of a, a massive particle in a rotating frame, this is the Sagnac phase. For a charged particle in a B field, it would be the Aronoff bohm phase. But in both cases, they arise from some non-commutativity of the space in which you're now moving. Okay, you also see the appearance of a transverse Hall response. If you apply a force in the x direction, that's just a potential which varies linearly with x. And so time evolution under this potential looks like a y translation. And generalizing this to an arbitrary scalar potential v, you infer that particles will always locally flow orthogonal to the force that they feel at a rate proportional to that force. This is just isopotential flow. You can check that generically this flow is incompressible, which in some sense is a real space instance of Louisville's theorem. Okay, real space is nice and phase space, and so particles will flow as an incompressible fluid within it. And so now to go to the experiment, um, I won't spend too long on this, this first one, but essentially what we realized here was by application of the right scalar potential in the rotating frame, we affected a coherent transformation between a condensate in which all atoms occupy a single symmetric gauge wave function, okay? into a condensate in which all atoms occupy a single lambda gauge wave function. So it's quite striking to be able to take an image of this thing. This is, I remember sketching this as an undergrad, but yeah, this is a picture of about half a million atoms in a single wave function within the expressed within the lambda gauge. Okay, and the way that we did this was by application in the rotating frame of a saddle potential. Okay? You might naively think that particles will fall downhill. That's what you're used to from your sort of inertial frame intuition. You're forgetting about the B field though, and so in, under application of this saddle, um, the particles will exhibit isopotential drift. They'll flow outward along one diagonal, and quite counterintuitively, they'll flow inward along the other. Okay, so the cloud actually dilates exponentially in time along one axis and contracts along the other. And so this gives you a hyperbolic flow profile within real space, which in this case is now phase space. This is nothing more than a squeezing transformation. Okay. You can be a little bit more careful and show that indeed the Hamiltonian corresponding to application of a saddle potential and a gauge field is nothing more than a squeezing operator acting on the guiding center coordinates. Okay, so folks are interested in more details. There are many more details um, in the, the paper itself. Okay. And so this really set the stage for the next topic, which I'll touch on. Um, and the starting point here is quite simple. We perform the geometric squeezing protocol I've just described. We prepare a single lambda gauge wave function, lambda gauge condensate, we sometimes refer to it, and then simply turn off the, the, the saddle potential. So this freezes the outward flow of atoms. In the rotating frame, you now live in a completely flat scalar potential, and your particles are subject purely to, um, there's a kinetic energy term in your Hamiltonian, which of course contains a vector potential, and there's interactions between atoms, and there's nothing else. There's no drive and there's no trap. Okay. And so this is a very sort of nice Hamiltonian to play with, because um, this interplay between gauge fields um, and interactions is, um, is a very interesting one and something that's nice to get a handle on experimentally. And so to be a little bit more convincing, if we write out our Hamiltonian within explicitly, well, with an explicit choice of the Lando gauge, um, it takes, of course, the form of a harmonic oscillator in the x direction. Um, and the, of course, the, the position of your harmonic trap in the x direction is locked to the y momentum of the particles. And that locking um, is sort of the manifestation of the B field in which you live. Okay. So if you now figure out your, 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 your um, eigenstates of this Hamiltonian, they take the form of translationally invariant strips. Um, and what we're, what we're preparing here is a macroscopic occupation of one of these eigenstates. Okay. And this was kind of a surprise in the lab, but it turns out that if you do absolutely nothing to this gas and simply watch how it evolves, what we saw was the following. Okay, so there was a development of a snaking instability, eventually leading to a fragmentation into individual droplets. So what's kind of cute is that if two of these droplets meet each other, rather than the linear fringes you'd expect in an inertial frame, 
you instead see a line, a street of vortices. This reflects the presence of circulation within each of these superfluid blobs because you're living in a frame where there's a vector potential. Okay. Okay, and so maybe this was very surprising to us to see. Maybe in retrospect, we shouldn't have been so surprised in that it turns out um, that this competition between crystals and liquids actually has quite a long history in quantum Hall materials. And actually, if you forgot everything you knew about quantum Hall matter, you might think that the ground state of repulsive particles with quenched kinetic energy would be a solid. Okay. Um, and in fact, if you go back to the abstract of the 1982 paper reporting observation of the fractional quantum Hall effect, this is suggested as a possible explanation. Okay, but it was shown very shortly afterwards that this couldn't be the case. And then very shortly after that, 1983, Bob Loughlin put forward his famous wave function describing not a crystal, but a correlated liquid. But this underlying tendency to crystallize still shows up in quantum Hall liquids as the so-called magnetoroton, which is a softening of collective excitations at the magnetic length. And so in some sense here, what we've, um, we've obtained in our experiment is really an extreme case of this, where this magnetoroton has now hit zero and gone from being a softened but real-valued collective excitation um, to a dynamical instability. And so to understand what's going on, it's helpful to think about um, different limits. So we can first turn to the case that the chemical potential is much smaller than the cyclotron frequency, which means all particles are confined to the lowest lambda level. And so it's convenient then, you can take your full Hamiltonian, you can just project into the lowest lambda level, perform a Bogolyubov approximation, and what you end up with is sort of a generic bosonic quadratic Hamiltonian. And this, of course, contains terms of two forms. There are terms that look like A dagger A, this is some kind of energy cost. And there are also terms that take the form A dagger K, A dagger minus K. Okay, in this case, A, A, K, and A dagger K, these are operators which create or destroy a boson living inside a lambda gauge wave function labeled by wave vector K along the y direction. Okay. And physically, what this corresponds to is pair production, that the interactions are trying to scatter two atoms from the condensate into plus or minus K. And so in something like liquid helium or in an, in an interacting BEC in an inertial frame, the point is that this, these energy cost type terms are always stronger than pair production. And so these, this pair production part of the Hamiltonian, it gives rise to fluctuations. It gives rise to some non-zero steady state population of higher K states and what you might call quantum depletion, but nothing runs away in time. Okay. What's happening in this case is that these pair production terms are stronger than these energy cost terms, um, which then leads to an exponential growth of the number of particles in plus or minus k um, and um, a dynamical instability. And so one very qualitative way to see why this might be very different to an inertial frame is that because you're in a magnetic field, there is now a coupling between position and momentum. So by scattering two atoms into different momentum states, you also reduce their spatial overlap with the condensate, which um, softens the energy cost required to do this. Okay. So this is, of course, a quadratic Hamiltonian. You can just solve it exactly. And so what I'm showing in the bottom right is just the calculated collective excitation spectrum um, as a function of wave vector, which indeed shows a, din a, a, a dim dynamical instability. This dashed line indicates an imaginary energy of the collective excitation. Um, and one important point to take home here is that the axis, the y-axis, must be in units of the chemical potential. If you're living in the lowest lambda level, you're in a totally flat dispersion. There's only one energy scale in the system, which is set by the interactions. And so without calculating anything, any type of emergent dynamical instability must take place at a rate set by mu. Okay. Now, in the opposite limit, when you have many lambda levels occupied, um, if mu becomes sufficiently large, this discretization of lambda levels should become irrelevant. A sort of equivalent statement there is that quantum pressure will become irrelevant within a hydrodynamic description. And so again, just thinking sort of qualitatively, we know that the superfluid um, flow velocity, well, we you know, typically one associates that with the gradient of the phase of the superfluid wave function um, in the presence of a vector potential as an additional piece. And so that means that even if you are in an eigenstate of your Hamiltonian and the phase is uniform, your condensate must host a circulating flow pattern because there's a vector potential. In the case of a Landau gauge wave function that looks like upward flow along one side of your strip and downward flow along the other, I'm thinking about something like the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. It's maybe not so surprising that this type of counterflow is unstable. Okay. It actually turns out that an identical instability to the one we see in our quantum gas shows up across, we figure out nine orders of magnitude and length scale at some point. We try to figure this out. It shows up as the diocotron instability in a cyclotron. So there it's driven by the B field of the cyclotron and the Coulomb repulsion between particles within it. Um, and also one of our math colleagues at MIT pointed out the same thing happens in oceans, the so-called line plumes. 
So these are sort of strips of buoyant water emitted from some kind of volcanic ridge in the ocean. As it rises up through the water, the rotation of the Earth drives exactly the same transition. Okay. Um, and so what we're silly, you know, the difference here is that we can take, you know, this is like an, an oceanic phenomenon, and using the quantum gas, you can take it all the way to the lowest lambda level. Okay. Okay. There's far too much too much math here. Um, the sort of take home of all of this is that once you drop quantum pressure from your hydrodynamic description, you're only left with one time scale, which is set by the cyclotron frequency, and one length scale, which is set by some combination of interactions, mass, and the cyclotron frequency. So yeah, maybe this is this maybe a little bit too much in there. Okay. And so maybe this to um, you know, quickly get to the, the, the take-home message, the, the key point I'd want to make here is that there's really, we should expect a very qualitative difference depending on whether you're living in the lowest lambda level or whether you have a classical superfluid. Okay, and that difference should be that in the lowest lambda level, the rate of this crystallization one expects to be set by the interactions, by the chemical potential mu, but conversely, if you have classical superfluid hydrodynamics, this, this crystallization should take place at a rate set by the cyclotron frequency. Okay. So we can now remember that we're experimentalists and actually do an experiment. Um, I won't dwell too long um, on, on this slide, but essentially you can map out the length scale of this emergent crystal um, and check that it, it evolves in the way you expect um, with the, the lambda level filling. Um, maybe the most important plot here is shown on the right. The, the um, sort of purpose of this slide is to indicate that we can measure the, the time evolution of the structure factor. But what I'm showing on the right here is essentially a plot of the crystallization rate gamma, shown as a function of what's, in some sense, the lambda level filling. It's the ratio of the chemical potential to the cyclotron frequency. Um, and indeed, what we were very you know, happy to see is that as you go to large lambda level fillings, this rate approaches a constant. This dashed horizontal um, line indicates the classical limit. Whereas once you enter the lowest lambda level, you see a crossover to a regime in which instead it's the, the interactions themselves. And so this is completely interaction-driven behavior. There would be no dynamics in the lowest lambda level in the absence of interactions. Once you turn them on, though, they give rise to this dynamical instability. Okay. And so in the last few minutes, I'll just show you something about um, what's very much the most recent work. As I said, there's an archive paper out um, pretty recently um, concerning the propagation of chiral edge states. And so you know, everyone has seen this type of picture before. Um, you know, even at a classical level, you know that if you take a magnetic field and place electrons within it, these electrons perform cyclotron orbits. If you now pro, um, a, a, add a boundary to your system, your electrons will always undergo specular reflection at the boundary, and now the chirality of your cyclotron orbits is reflected as a directional flow along the boundary of the system. Okay. This, survive, this picture survives very straightforwardly into a more quantum picture, at least a, a wave um, um, description. So here we imagine a wall in the y direction. So our wall is shown in green, and it's translationally invariant along x. A very convenient gauge choice in this case um, is, of course, the Landau gauge, which where your vector potential is translationally invariant along your wall. If you just write out your Hamiltonian within this gauge, it again takes the form of a harmonic oscillator in the y direction, of course, whose center in y is set by the momentum along the wall. Okay? And so by staring at this for a moment, you realize that there are two very different limits one can consider. If your wave vector k is much less than zero, the center of your harmonic trap, your effective harmonic trap, is far in the bulk. The atoms don't explore the boundary, and you recover a flat lambda level dispersion. Okay? And conversely, though, if your wave vector is much larger than zero, the minimum of this effective harmonic trap now moves into the forbidden region. Atoms can't follow it. They remain locked at the wall position at something like y equals zero. And that means that this second term in your Hamiltonian contributes an energy which varies quadratically in k. And if you now just keep track of your h bars and your n's and so on, what you recover is an energy which you expect to look something like h bar squared k squared over 2m, which is extremely familiar, um, which is nothing more than a, a free particle dispersion, with the crucial difference being that this only exists for positive k. Okay? Which means that you expect the boundary of your system to host particles which propagate with a free particle dispersion, but only in one direction. Okay. And so there's a long history of you know, a lot of interest and a lot of history in folks trying to create these edge states within um, um, AMO systems um, to brush a lot of you know, fantastic work over. Well, to brush over it very quickly, I would just point out the majority of experiments have been done using so called synthetic dimensions, where you use an internal state manifold as an effective spatial um, um, coordinate. The big advantage of that is it gives you a, naturally a very hard boundary. Okay? But I'd point out that actually very, also very recently, a few months ago, there was a report from the Munich group where they also realized 
and the propagation of edge modes um, in real space, this time using a driven optical lattice rather than a rotating frame. Okay, so the experiment here is actually very, uh, very simple. Um, we perform exactly the same geometric squeezing protocol we've already introduced. So we switch on a saddle potential. Atoms flow, radi uh, flow, flow radially along a diagonal of the saddle, but now in addition we project a very sharp optical boundary onto the system. And so when atoms flow outward, at some point they encounter this boundary, they continue to feel an azimuthal force um, from the, the, the saddle potential, which continues to increase their momentum along the edge and injects them into an edge mode at the, at the, at the boundary. Okay, so here's an image of this happening. Um, so these atoms are flowing outward along the saddle potential. At some point, they encounter the wall, and they begin to propagate directionally along the edge. Okay. Now, in the rotating frame, the Hamiltonian is static, which means energy is conserved. And so by simply knowing how far the atom has propagated azimuthally, we know by how much the saddle potential has changed, and we can therefore infer how far up the edge dispersion the atoms have moved. Okay. We can then turn off the saddle potential after some propagation time. This freezes the moment momentum evolution, and atoms will then subsequently propagate at constant wave vector. And so here's an image of that happening. Um, so the atoms just continue to propagate for really hundreds of microns around the edge of the system. First thing you do, of course, is extract the propagation speed um, of the wave front. And so here we're showing the propagation speed of this edge state shown as a function of injected wave vector. Um, there's a couple of theory lines, but essentially there's no fit here. We're just comparing this measured data to the propagation speed you'd expect of a chiral free particle. This is just velocity varying linearly with k, and we see extremely good agreement. Okay, so that's indeed indicating that the boundary of the system hosts you know, free atoms, but they're directional and they're group velocity. Okay, this kind of reminded us of these, wall, they're called a wall of death, these things. You can see why it's called a wall of death, it looks kind of dangerous. The reason it put us in mind of this is that if you look at the energy scale here, the, the, these atoms have an energy of something like 50 times the, the land level spacing of the bulk. So they're really extremely excited compared to the bulk energy levels. Um, but of course, there's no decay. These things are energetically projected, and they, they just sit up on the walls of this dispersion, just like this, this guy on a motorbike. Yeah. OK. So the last, um, project, the last aspect of this I'll touch on, um, we, once we have this, the edge states propagating in real space, a very straightforward, well, it's not necessarily not so straightforward, but at least on paper, straightforward thing to do is to play around with the structure of your confining potential. Okay, so so far everything I've talked about is concerned an infinitely sharp wall, which is never the case in any experimental system. And so here, the, the model will consider is a, a, a sort of the simplest um, um, example you can once you go beyond an infinitely sharp wall, and it's just a linear wall. Okay, so you imagine that the, lin the wall is linear; it has a slope set by some dimensionless parameter alpha, which in this case essentially measures by how many cyclotron frequencies does your wall vary by over one magnetic length. Okay. And so, again, just thinking about this for a moment, you realize, again, there are two very different limits to consider. Okay. So if the wave vector of your edge mode is less than or comparable to alpha, that means that a wave packet of typical extent of the magnetic length will explore your force discontinuity. You explore the curvature of the potential at this kink that couples cyclotron and guiding center coordinates. And as long as alpha is itself is much larger than unity, you expect some kind of universal hard wall behavior. It shouldn't matter whether alpha is you know, 100 or 1,000 or a million or a billion. Okay? Once you have a steep wall, um, then you expect that your physics should become insensitive to the steepness. Okay? But conversely, this is kind of obvious in retrospect, but was a surprising thing for us to realize. Regardless of how steep you've managed to make your boundary, you can always find a sufficiently large wave vector k so that your wave packet lives exclusively in the linear region of your wall. And this is physically important because a linear potential does not couple cyclotron and guiding center coordinates. And that means that as if your atoms are living up in your linear region, you know, cyclotron and guiding centers are not coupled, your, the splitting between your edge bands must take its bulk value of one cyclotron frequency. And furthermore, the propagation speed of your particles will again be set by the steepness of your wall. Okay, so you'll recover E cross B drift. And so this was really surprising. We sort of felt as experimentalists, hey, once you've made a steep wall, life's good. This is essentially infinitely sharp. That's absolutely not true. You can always find a large enough K that you will recover E cross B drift, um, and your splitting between edge bands will go back to being cyclotron frequency. Okay. And so just to summarize that argument, what I'm plotting here is your expected um, propagation speed V shown as a function of wall steepness alpha for some um, injected wave vector k. And what we expect is that for shallow walls, this speed should vary linearly with the steepness, whereas for sharper walls, it should saturate um, at the chiral free particle result. 
Okay. And so that's what I'm showing here is the propagation. This is the evolution of angle with time for two different wall steepnesses. You qualitatively all might notice that it propagates faster for the steeper wall, but then you can go and be more careful, and this is a result of the experiment. So um, what you indeed see is a regime in which your speed increases proportionally to your steepness before then saturating at the chiral free particle result. Okay. Um, and then the final um, um, observation, as I already mentioned, you expect for large wave vectors or correspondingly for small um, steepnesses, if your particles, if your wave packet of some extent set by the magnetic length lives only in your linear region, then guiding centers and cyclotron um, coordinates remain uncoupled. And so the splitting between your edge bands will simply take its bulk value set by the cyclotron frequency. On the other hand, if you live um, at the kink and you explore the curvature um, at, this, at, 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 at this position here, um, this will now couple guiding centers and cyclotrons, and you expect some deviation from the bulk value. Okay. Um, and so that's what we measured here. We essentially do this by exciting a dipole oscillation, so exciting some small admixture of the first excited edge band. What this results in is as the atoms propagate azimuthally around uh, the boundary of our system, they also oscillate radially. Okay. And so by extracting the spatial period of these oscillations, we can infer the splitting between the ground and the first excited edge band. That's what's plotted here against wall steepness alpha. And what you again see is that you start off at the bulk lambda level splitting of one cyclotron frequency. And as your wall steepness increases, this splitting begins to increase. And this all agrees very well with um, a sort of the analytically um, calculable dispersion relation in the presence of a soft edge. Okay. So I'll wrap up. I would, well, I could finish with some nice pictures, but I'd prefer to finish with the folks who really um, um, were involved in this. So Ray Zhao and Sung Jae, the students who really pushed um, the edge state work through um, in the last half year or so. Um, I'm also building up a new machine um, at MIT, um, which is a degenerate erbium lithium uh, mixture. So I'd like to acknowledge the brave folks um, involved in that, um, and also Martin, with whom um, this rotating work has been carried out. So thanks for your attention. Thank you. So maybe just one single, the most important question. Yes, please. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, you, you have the atoms condensating in one lowest K. Um, can you think of how to mitigate them to all Ks to see a fractional hall? Yeah, so yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, so, so, in, so these experiments, um, the, the selection of the wave function that you're in is sort of a function of the history of the experiment. I mean, you start off with a you know, vanilla B you see in a harmonic trap, and so that very naturally selects a particular symmetric gauge wave function. If you apply this geometric squeezing, that coherently transforms you into a particular lambda gauge wave function. So it's not necessarily the lowest K. I mean, K is a sort of gauge dependent quantity, but it's a K. Um, is, is, is it possible to have a slide? Maybe just the next slides back would be. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, oh, okay, cool. I can go. Yeah, so I think f f f what you ask is, of course, the question. Um, so this has been a lot of fun, but honestly, it's a little bit hard to connect some of this more wave function specific physics to something like fractional quantum Hall behavior. So what's currently going on is to take this into a uniform density filling of the system. Um, so what you'd like to get to is sort of a, a flat scalar potential, a, 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 a presence of a gauge field, um, but um, some kind of uniform density. So we actually have this in the lab now. Um, the challenge, so I have to go back through um, everything, but there's, I promise the very next slide is, yeah, there it is, cool. So this is, um, this is now uniform density filling of atoms. Then ro they're rotating at the trap frequency, and they also have a boundary that's pro providing the edge of this. So this is sort of a rotating bucket experiment now. Um, in these images, we have a chemical potential of something like the cyclotron frequency. So they're on the cusp of the lowest lambda level. But the filling fraction, the number of atoms per flux quantum, is still maybe tens. You know, It depends on which two, whether you include two pi's. Maybe it's 100, maybe it's 50. Um, so at this point, you kind of get to the edge. You can you can sort of argue why this is the case, but you get to the edge of what absorption imaging can do. So you, actually, what's currently happening, probably at the moment in the lab, is that we're putting in fluorescence imaging. So the idea is to do physics at much lower densities, pin the atoms using a lattice, and then do single atom imaging. Um, so 
There's actually a very clear route to lower filling fractions, but just not using the imaging with which this work was done. Yeah, but I, I think this is a more natural setup for that direction than, I think the previous stuff, it's, it's kind of cute physics, but it's just harder to connect. I think this is easy, more straightforward. Yeah.